but I agreed to do this. I, I like Brian McLaren. I thought, oh, this is good. I'll do one of those. Chose the one on Harmony, so I have several weeks not to have to prepare. But I started reading the book. If you look at the way I read a book, it's dog-eared, it's underlined, it's messages to myself, it's memories that I have. So if anybody takes my book, you will journey along in this book with me. Although these will be my stories, not necessarily yours, but you feel free to write your own comments, keep it, or pass it on to somebody else. Because I am finished with it. And I have pondered this. I have pondered these issues probably since I was 12 years old. I have known as long as I could remember that I am a spiritual being having a human experience. And for all the years that I've taught school, I always said to teenagers, this is not who we are. This is like my vehicle. Who I am resides inside me. And so what you see, I would show them, oh gosh, could I show you my arms these days with spinoptic all over. My back was like, I've got leprosy. <laughs> and then I can't hear and I can't half see. But that's really where I am. I am this being that resides inside this vehicle. And I want you to know that. Because I know that about all of you. This is just our vehicle, and one day it will wear out, and we will pass over. And I have spent a lifetime of thinking about the things that he wrote, these stages in this book. So I've been preparing for a lifetime, but I've done some extra preparing over these past weeks, and it's just amazing the things that come. Just amazing. A couple of weeks ago, I woke up at six o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, I've got to have an altar. I've got to have an altar. Well, altar to some people, I said altar to Julie, and she had one thought of an altar, said it to somebody else, and theirs was entirely different. But when I say altar, in my language, and in what uh, I see as an altar, it is what you see before you. It's like my toolkit. It's like my box of tools that I carry with me wherever I go. So that when things are challenging, or when things are wonderful, or I need help, I dig into this tool bag, and this is these are the th some of the things, just a few of the things that are in my tool bag, or you could call it an altar because they become really holy to me. In fact, as we sit here together tonight, talking about the the thing I'm in charge of is harmony, but it's a faith that it, it expresses itself in love. A faith that expresses itself in love. So that can, can go in a million directions. We have guests here from uh, the Union Church. And their covenant that they say every Sunday morning is just beautiful. A love beyond faith. A, a yeah. faith beyond love. The power of the love beyond faith. Power of uh, Power of a love beyond belief. power of a love beyond belief. Isn't that just beautiful? Isn't that just cool? See, I can't even say it, but I but it but every time I'm standing in that church and I I read that, I stand there with tears. Because I think that's what we're about too. And if if we are moving into the new kind of church, the new kind of faith community, not church, but not kind of we think of buildings then we're going to have to think broader. So, wake up and spend two hours in my head thinking, what am I going to put on my altar? What are the things that are in my head? I'm traveling around my house thinking, oh, I've got to put this book. Oh, I've got to put that book. Wait a minute. Oh, I've got to get my dream journal. Oh, my heavens, my dream journal's got to go on an altar. So, the morning I got up after thinking about it, and I had two hours. I go to this basket where I have two or three partially filled dream journals. Where's that dream journal? Oh, here it is. And I pick it up and I open it up, just looking, thinking, okay, let's see a dream I dreamed one night. And this was February the 2nd, 2006. And this is the time I usually go back and title my dreams. Now I haven't I haven't recorded a dream in a long time, in probably a couple of years. I do it sporadically, but I do, do know how important they are. This was the one that I dreamed that I opened the book to that morning. We're having a women's family weekend. 
So Barbara was there. I've gone to the airport to pick up some of the women. We're all headed home. Driving this really curvy road through the mountains. And there's a huge drop off on the right. We're discussing what to have for dinner and decided that, uh, decided eating out was the easiest. I'm driving. My daughter Chris, my daughter Jennifer, Barbara, and some others are in the car. And all of a sudden, I miss the curve and the curve goes off, the car goes off the side of the mountain. Long way to the ground, I'm thinking. This is it. No way to save us. I want to hold everyone's hands. And I think of all the men in the family, they're going to be left. But I wake up then with this huge, clear awareness that I love everybody. No, wait a minute. I, I scream this as we're going down. I love everybody. And then when I woke up and thought of the dream, all of a sudden it was, I know that all that remains is for And so my dream journal has to go on an altar all morning. I just knocked <laughs> over Jesus. <laughs> and he's went back on the back of the table. <laughs> can't pull him back there, but Arthur can. <laughs> That's perfect. I don't need to have to stand up because I'm going to hold him a minute. Oh, everything I believe since I've been as far back as I can remember, the faith that I've always held on to. It's not the messages necessarily that I've gotten from the church about Jesus. But it's the, the Jesus that I love. So I want to tell you a story about this Jesus that I love. That is available to anyone in any faith. Because he's a man that walked on the earth, I believe. But he didn't say, at least in, I'm going to probably say things that a lot of you don't agree with. And that is okay. But you know what this new community of faith is going to look like we bring whatever we believe we bring wherever we are we bring all of our doubts all of our questions and we are all a part of this community of love this is what hopefully the church will look like in the future and we're working i mean we always work this is the story of my neighbor and people who are in the upper in class i know you've heard me tell the story but I will tell it again, because every time I tell it, I hear it in myself, and I feel it again myself. I have this lovely, lovely neighbor that I don't know well, but she's one of those people I knew as soon as I met her. If you know what I'm talking about, the people you know all your lives, you don't really know them, and then there are these people that you meet, and you know them almost instantly, and she is one of those. Uh, two or three years ago, right? It was during the pandemic, early in the pandemic. She, I saw her, and she said, "This was after the fact. It was right before Easter. That's right that year." And she, I said, "Susan, I haven't seen your car." And she said, "Well, I, I've been on the trip, and I've gotten back recently." And she began to tell me the story of her brother. She grew up in Kentucky with about seven or eight children in her family, and her youngest baby brother, she said, had been homeless for some time. And the last time they knew anything about him, he was in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, some of you probably been there. If you haven't, you've seen things on the TV, and we all know it's a huge city with a huge homeless population. And she said her sister, who lived up in New York State, Susan works in the... Uh, as a social worker in the school systems in Clinton, I believe it is. So school has started. You know, a big law that is written, you don't take time off from school once school has started, unless you've got a huge emergency. But her sister called and she said, Susan, we've got to go find our brother. We have to go find our brother. So Susan went to whoever God was in that school district, and they gave her permission to take some weeks off to drive across country camping to get to Phoenix, hoping that they would find her brother, but their brother there. So they packed tent, a tent, sleeping bags, camping gear, headed across country. Got to Phoenix, 
found an Airbnb where they could park all their stuff and it would have a bathroom, shower, a place for them to sleep and hit the streets in Phoenix, Arizona, looking for their brother. They had not been on the streets more than 30 minutes when her sister says to Susan, Susan, there he is. There he is. This man was laying on the street, asleep, wrapped up with a blanket. But she could see his knees. All she could see was his knees. And she said, that's our brother. And they knelt down and said something to him. And he opened his eyes. And it was her brother, their baby brother, 30 minutes. And they squatted down beside him. And her sister said, he recognized them. She, she, she said, they said, we come to find you and to see how you are and to take you home with us if you will come. We have an Airbnb. And if you will come with us, we've got shower, we'll get some clean clothes. But if you don't want to or you can't, we have our sleeping bags and we are prepared to lay down on the sidewalk and sleep here with you. If that's not an Easter story, a resurrection story, a story of the love of this person for me, this is the story, Jesus loves me, this I know. Not that I'm the savior of the world, not that you have to follow my path, not you gotta follow all the rules, just Jesus loves me, this I know. And it was, I thought, that's how much Jesus loves us. That is how much this Jesus that I follow loves every single one of us. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be good. It's not going to offer. It's the lost and the found. Lost and the found. And it's not us. We don't have to do the seeking. He's going to be right there seeking us, the lost and the found. So there's Jesus. And then my table is just filled with books. And I could tell you the stories of every one of these books. I will not do that. <laughs> But they changed my life. You know, I, I read a book recently about the book of Mary Magdalene, a book that was left out of the Bible for good reason. No good reason for me, but it was a good reason for the men that decided to leave it out long ago. But now I can read about it. Uh, oh, gosh. 1976, I read my first book. It, it was one of the first ones that came out about people who have experiences of dying and coming back. I've never heard of that. Never heard of that. Max in the hospital having some little day, you know, a few hour surgery, and I'm sitting there reading that book about these tunnels that people saw and the light that they saw. I'm thinking, Kevin, and then they come back and tell about it, talk about it. I think, heavens above, this is really wild. I'm sitting next to this man, and he says, what are you reading? He's waiting for somebody having outpatient surgery, too. He said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading this crazy book about people who have who died temporarily and come back and tell about it. And the man got really quiet, and he said, I had that. This was 1976. What war was just right there, Vietnam. He said, I'm a Vietnam vet. And I had that experience on the battlefield, and I had never told anyone about it because I thought that they would think I was crazy. And so I did not tell him what I was reading. I just said, it's, it's, I've never read this before. I said, what was your experience? And he described it to me, and it was exactly what I was reading, just exactly. About three or four days later, I'm giving birth to my last child, 35 years old. And then you got to stay in the hospital for two or three days instead of shipping you off just as soon as you get birth. And I'm still reading the same book. Laying up in the bed in between, trying to breastfeed a baby, not having a clue how to do that, and no help with it at that point in my life, and that point in our work, in sport work. And this lady comes in to clean my room. And she said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading this a very unusual book about something I haven't heard of before, but some of it has been people who have experiences of dying and coming back. And she got quiet and she said, my daughter had one of those experiences. 
And I said, really? What was it? What was it? She said, well, we don't talk about it because you're know, afraid people think she's crazy. I said, well, describe it to me. I had not told her one word that I had written, not read, other than it was a book. She described her daughter's experience. It was exactly what I was reading. Exactly. The tunnel, the light, the coming back, this feeling of love, not wanting to come back. So I've been reading since 1976, every book I found on people who have those kind of experiences. Believe me, it does a whole lot to dispel your fear of dying. Not the process necessarily, but what it's going to be like. I'm counting on it. That's what all these people are doing. We'll see. I'll let you know. <laughs> oh, that brings me to this. Let you know from the other side. This is our. Then I'm going to pass. This is our mother, Barbara and I, and my mother. And Mac drew a charcoal picture of a tiny, tiny little photograph that we have of her. And she was probably about 16 years old. And then down in the corner, it hangs in my son. Down in the corner of it, there's a picture of mother on her 87th birthday. And she died at 96 at White Oak. Uh, Independent living, actually. Assisted. Which, yeah, assisted. It's called assisted living. Right. But anyway, there she is, and there's a tiny little picture of when she's for all. Well, this winter, Maddie, my granddaughter, who's 23, was visiting, and she and I were standing in the sunroom and, and just talking and looking out at the trees outside. And all of a sudden, I glanced at this picture. And pass this one around. This is the way it looks. It's always looked. Look at the picture of my mother, our mother. Then, but that day, lo and behold, I want you to look at this picture. I'm gonna pass it around. There was this sh these things that looked like angel wings all around her. And you know, I I can think of a million things ex ways people could explain that. Just like the many explanations I've read about what people experience when they pass over, it's all kinds of things. I choose, I guess, what I want to believe. But this is an extraordinary picture. And it was, I said, Mammy, come here and look. And she, you know, just walked over a few feet and she looked. I took a picture real quick. I said, look, there was a great grandmother that she didn't really ever know. She met her once when she was just a baby, really. She didn't know her. But this is the picture that afternoon. So this person that's standing up in front of you has the most broadest view of so many things, but grounded in a deep knowing of the importance of love. That that's it, really, that's it. So this is another example of something I have read and found that I had to have on the authors thinking, got to have these things. Well, here's a glass of water. And I put the word love in front of that glass of water. Have any of you read the book, seen the book, pictures, or I don't know, we're up to the city, so I saw the book. The Hidden Messages of Water. Oh, it's a movie? The Hidden Messages of Water was me? A dot like a documentary? I did not know that. I have not seen that. Well, that's wonderful to know. I had the book. But this this man, I don't know, I think he was the day. So he was Japanese, he was a photographer, but a scientist, and he figured out a way to take photographs of water crystals so that you could see what the water crystal looked like from various water from different places. But one of the things he did is just put a word it or you know, hard rock uh, that had a really deep, dark message in it. If, if anything that is like the word love, the word hate, the word, the word anger, certain kinds of music, he put it in front of the vessels of water and took photographs of when it was frozen of what those water crystals look like. And it's, it's incredible. So I put the book up here. Please pick it up and look at it because you will be astounded. So I came up here this afternoon and I set up this altar and, altar and put the Ask a question. Sure. Is there a way? Sure, we pass the book around. Is there a way to connect all this to the topic of harmony? 
Uh, Janet, let me address that. This is harmony. This harmony is the place that you reach in your life. This is harmony. I am not going to tell about the book. Every one of you, if you want to read it, can read the book. I don't need to repeat what you can read, so I will not do that. I do not teach that way. You read it if you want to know the facts. I am not a facts person. I don't have a fact in my head. <laughs> on, the, on the virus break, I have a sea rubble. Thank you. <laughs> I have a sea rubble. Meditations. This is one of his books, Falling Upward. This is the way I prepared for tonight. This is the way I prepared. Stayed awake. This was about a week ago. Went to bed, slept an hour, woke up. All these things going around my head. Couldn't stop them. So I thought, I've got to get up and go get a book that I might find not like the novel I was reading, which was very, very interesting, which would kept me, keep me awake. So I walked to the bookcase looking for a book that I could read that night so I could go back to sleep and reach out, pick out a book. I could see what it was, but didn't think much about it. And it's Richard Moore's Falling Upward. So I pull it out of the thing, go get on the living room sofa so I wouldn't wake back up, start reading so I could go to sleep. 6.30 the next morning, I was still reading the book. It was so wonderful. I had actually read it in 2011. And, you know, we're different people at different places in our life, aren't we? Yep. So I was reading this book again for the first time. And what he does in this book is describe so beautifully a person who lives their lives in harmony. So maybe this, let me, let's see. Where is that shoot? Yeah. So, so Janet, I can do five minutes when I'm supposed to do it. Yeah, if anybody wants one of these, help yourself. <laughs> but I'm going to read it to you. These are the, the, the four stages of faith that somebody copied. And some of you may have looked at it, and some of you may have not. I didn't look at it until a week or so ago and thought, oh my gosh, I do see where we're going with this. Oh, wait a minute. Got a sheet. Huh. If I get it with the question, that'll be good. If I don't, I'm okay. <laughs> That's exactly right. You might look over them, have some thoughts about them, and we'll get to it. We'll answer some of them. And if not, we won't. I, I, you know, at age, almost 82, I can only be who I am. And what you see standing up here is who I am. If we get to the questions, that would be good. If I can do this part, you'll at least see a written thing of what harmony is supposed to be like. But it is like that. I read this and I say, yeah, that makes sense. I liked it. All right, this is the first note. Harmony, the focus of harmony, inclusion and transcendence. Everybody, everybody, no exceptions, are a part of a, of a faith community that expresses itself in love. When we reach the place of living in from harmony, but you know what? That takes people in that place, living their own lives in a, from a place of harmony, doesn't it? Seems like that to me. The motive behind this characteristic, this fourth stage, is finding connection. Seeing things whole, making a contribution. Now, is that not true? 
here we sit trying to make find some ways we can connect. Key values, being compassionate. Good gracious, what did Jesus say we should be about? Being compassionate, seeking the common good, not the good for this little group of white privileged people. We want some common good going on here. Not for those people that are neighbors across the street that are at the soup kitchen on Sunday morning. They are our neighbors. We're part of the same us and them. It's all us. Assumption that we are all connected, that we are part of the greater whole. I know that to be true. You know, it may not be anything that, that resonates with you now, but in my own life, I know that to be true. Who are the authority figures? This was my favorite. Guess who the authority figures are in this new community? It's not Kim. Certainly not me. Valuable people. So I guess that includes all of us. We are all the authority figures. We are the authority figures of our own lives. And when we share those lives together, we all get to be the authority figures. It doesn't have to be an old white man standing up at the pulpit. Excuse me. You don't play that role. You never pretend to be the authority uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, the us are all part of a bigger us. Life is a mysterious gift. Identity. We are interdependent. We will all rise together or we will all fall together. We are interdependent. Belonging. Oh, listen to this. I am seeking. See, this is who you are. I can tell you right now, this is who I am. We are all seeking understanding, connection, the common good, even when there are opponents and enemies. We're all looking for connection. And if I, I'm not going to answer this question, but if I did, if somebody wants to answer, you feel free. Why are you here? You know, it's covering at this moment of the day. Every single person has made an effort for some reason to be here. Does it have something to be to do with connection? We need community. Loneliness is to, that's the worst thing we can suffer, isn't it? Even above being deaf and blind, halfway, I'm not. I'm not going to But it's loneliness. You know, it leads right into some of the worst things that that are ha is happening in our world today. God is. Look at what God is. I love that. Loving present. Present. Creative wisdom. Known through experience and metaphor. When I was about six years old, I pictured God as being this old white man with a long beard, white beard at that, sitting on some kind of throne up in the sky. Now that's been a long time ago. And this is a, a definition. God is a loving presence where nobody is excluded for any reason from that huge, compassionate, kind love. The core question is what part can I play for the good? Mistakes are inevitable. They are a part of learning, a part of growth. You know, going through these stages, one of the things that certainly came out, and I just didn't read the book, as you know, is that there's doubt throughout the stages, but it's through that that we have an opportunity to grow. You know, when we butt edges with people and we rub edges and we share stories, and this is where I am, this is where you are, we have an opportunity to finally grow when everything's just going along so smooth. Growth is not quite as inevitable. Our strengths. It integrates all of our previous strengths. This little girl, this is me, who was so shy that I wouldn't say a word in class. She had to, that was me, until I was 18 years old. I didn't ever want to write, I didn't ever want to raise my hand. I didn't want anybody to ever see me. I was so quiet. I wanted to just hide in the 
the corner. And do you know why that was? Do you know why that was? Somebody in here might have had that experience before because I was afraid. David Heatherly, who was a, a wonderful therapist here, uh, Dr. Heatherly, psychologist, he helped me see that. I said, David, I was uh, an introvert until I was 18 years old, actually in the night of graduate from high school. I made this conscious decision in my head to be different. And I said, I changed my life. I was this introvert, and then I went off to college and pretended to be something I wasn't. And David has only said to me very kindly, he said, John, you really come here straight by. You're an introvert or you're an extrovert or an ambivert, whatever. So he said, if you say, I said, I always said I was shy is the word I used. He said, shyness is about fear. Shyness is about fear. So for the next 10 years after hearing that, I was taking Tai Chi and there was a particular move in Tai Chi where you did this. And you did this. And you were closing the door on something. So in my head and in my heart, every single time I did that, for 10 years, I thought, what am I closing the door on? And then one day, I thought, I know what it is. It's fear. And you know what the fear was? That if somebody knew me, really knew me, they would not like me. But once I knew that fear, I worked on it, didn't take it away, didn't take it away at all. But I had met two people recently at this church who said to me, my greatest fear, it was all to my greatest fear, but I hadn't told them that yet, is that they would walk into a room and sit down and they would not have any, they would be sitting by themselves, nobody would sit next to them. That was one of my greatest fears. And yet, I, I didn't, when people told me that, I said, you've got to be kidding. You know what? That was one of my, has been one of my greatest fears. Sure, I'd walk into a room and somebody would say, no, that's it. You know, I get ready to sit down and they say, no, that seat's taken. No, that seat's taken. You know, and they were all taken. And I had no seat at the table. But you know what? I found this wonderful affirmation in this book. Decoding your emotional blueprint. Any This is the truth. One night we were, Mag and I were getting ready to leave. It's going to be late for Wednesday night dinner. As usual, as Janet has. I know. I know. It's going to be late, but I'm thinking, oh, you know, will we have a place to sit at the table? After all these years, still working at 82, still working on what I was working out on when I was 18 years old. I remembered I had read in this book an affirmation. All right. The judgment, the thing that I was thinking about myself is I don't belong. A sentence of resolution is I always have a place where I belong. But then, it's kind of an affirmation. So I literally went back to the bedroom, get ready to walk out of the house. I thought, I'm going to read that because I remember it, but I can't remember what the statement was. This is the statement. This is the affirmation that I brought with me that night. My sense of belonging inspires me to include others. Standing, walk, well, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to claim that for me. If I feel like I belong, then I can include all these others in my belonging. I have space for everybody. And then that makes me belong. You do. Walked in and got in line behind somebody. And I will not tell you who it is and who it is, and you will never know. But this person said to me, she said, you know, it is so hard for me to come to Wednesday night dinners because I'm always so afraid I won't have any place to sit with somebody. So I said, oh, gosh, you just expressed to me the fear that I brought here and the affirmation that I said before I left the house about belonging. So I said, I'll tell you one thing. You will never have to sit by yourself. I always have a place beside me where you can sit because I've had the same fear all of my life. 
so we can sit together. It is, it is just, this is harmony. This is living in a state of grace. This is living in a state of expecting good things to happen, even when you've got these little things that are still going on in your head from, you know, really child, but if we went back and had every, everybody could benefit Cam from a 12-step program and some real struggle with who we are and what we're here for and telling the truth about our lives. You know, it humiliates us probably to the core, but what Richard Moore said, I ask, I ask God every single day for one good humiliation. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in good company with Richard Moore. We can do that. Doesn't feel good. We squirm in our seats. But it really is good for us. Then we connect. You know, we don't connect as much from our perfectness, do we? Oh, I can have the perfect meal. I've got the perfect house. It's always clean. Oh, boy, was I the perfect mother. And then, you know, everybody thinks, well, I'm not sure I am up to that standard. The truth is, who needs to be perfect? What an unworthy goal, how horrible, what pressure that puts on all of us. So living in a state of harmony, so that I can connect some kind of dots here that weren't in the book, but they were in my head. And I have certainly put in my due time to stay awake all night reading that book and two hours on the altar. Pondering this stuff for three months now. That was my preparation. My preparation wasn't to repeat you out of the book. My preparation was to look at my life and to share my life so that let's do the questions. Okay. Okay, okay we're ready. <laughs> let's see. Where, where's my book? Oh, so let me find my book. The first, all right, the first one is what would you put on your altar? I'm going to skip that one. I hope you, you will all think about what, what would you put on your altar? What would you put, what would tool would you put in your tool bag? So we'll skip that. Let's go to the next. What, this is all from the book. These actually are questions that I formulated from what I read in the book. What is a lesson that was taught to you in your family or in your church as you were growing up? That you have come to doubt in your later years. If you're willing to just speak, you know, one sentence into the microphone, I'll hand you the mic. I don't know if this. I don't know if this is really exactly what you're looking at. But. When I grew up. We always say, Jesus loves little children, all the children of the world. And then when I grew up, it wasn't, it wasn't just like that exactly. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody else? Something, a lesson that you were taught in your family or in the church as you were growing up that you've come to doubt. just sort of let go of the concept or belief or teaching of eternal damnation um, because I believe that God's grace is sufficient and so if God's grace is sufficient it is sufficient and that there is no eternal damnation for any of us interpreting scriptures in a certain way anybody else want to say anything don't make See, am I not seeing you? So, oh, I didn't. The scripture for Jesus says, nobody comes to your father except by me. That's what I was taught when I was Did y'all hear what she said? I don't even, I didn't when I was 12. I didn't when I was 12. I don't. It can't be. We can't condemn the rest of the world to hell because they haven't known about Jesus Christ. I don't think. Okay. Um, in one of the stories that he tells in, in here, he says, uh, he, he, he is speaking before a group of people, which he does regularly. He travels all over the world, talking to church leaders, trying to find hope for that for our church. And he 
he has spoken, and this young woman gets up and comes up to him, and she says, you know what? You're talking about finding hope in the world. What I want you to do is what? We need to panic. You know, because every time to panic, watch the news. If you're not panicking, sitting here, you'll panic when you get home and watch the sitting on news. The world, or, or look at your own families and you see things that are happening. What is an issue in the world today that you think, we've got to panic here. It's not enough to just keep on doing the same old. Climate change. Oh, we need to panic. We need to panic. We should have panicked years ago. You know, you keep thinking, they keep saying it's too late, it's too late, and we still don't panic. We still don't do anything about it, or so little. I think that's an issue for panic. I, I can think of so many. Uh, I can think of so many. Women's rights being taken away. Believe what you want to believe about abortion or whatever. But nobody should decide that but you. But the woman, you know, don't and we're moving backwards. And I can think of many others too. One of the things he hits hard on toward the end of the book, the last portion of the book in this in this thing about harmony is what are we going to teach our children? How are we going to teach our children? You know what he says? We, we're talking about all these stages of doubt that, you know, at 82, they've been going through all these stages for 82 years. There's not 82 years left of these children. We've got to make some changes now. There isn't going to be any church here for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, future generations, if we don't make some changes. So he gets hard on um, one of the changes is that we've got to talk about God in a different way. And his favorite way that he puts out there is through nature. Through nature. You know that, don't you, Tim? You know that. Because that's true for you. Maybe totally true for you. Someone told me recently about the church she went to and somebody came in shorts and they were leading the music in shorts. And I'm thinking, heaven forbid. That's <laughs> <laughs> even being in shorts. And then the real thought is, who cares? They were in church leading the music. They were in church leading the music. Sunday afternoon, out in the park out here, I sat there. And I thought, this is a little tiny glimpse into the, a faith that could be possibility for a faith community that expresses itself in love. We're sitting actually in a columbarium, right outside a columbarium with the ashes. There's a labyrinth there that has been dedicated to the most beautiful woman, as beautiful as any woman who ever came through this church, and her name was Lily, and she kept the nursery for, I think, 40-some years and helped with many of your children. My children didn't grow up here, so it wasn't my children. But that labyrinth in front of that columbarium is in honor of Lily. And then you have these young people playing music that was 70s, 80s, 90s. Good gracious, I don't know that music. But the joy on their faces is they sang and played the music and their families that were there supporting them and the Bethel members because they were, he was, you told me he was the youth director at Bethel. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. I think music must cross all barriers of, you know, we don't have to agree politically. Well, a lot of music can be political today, but that was the Music, you know, poetry, there are certainly ways that we can see church that's not just reading a scripture out of the Bible. And it was, it was, it was one of the children playing, children happy, nobody had on dress up clothes, you know, shorts, sunbonnets, whatever that looked like. Uh, church of the, where it expresses itself in law. Okay. All right. Uh, which part do I want to make sure of the uh, this I do? I, maybe I'll just close with this. If, if you want one of these, 
please take one, but I think when I won't give it to you until I, after I finish. Um, yeah, here's a boot ahead because I don't think there is one path home. I think we all go home. Home is where we come from, which is unconditional love. But God is that I love you so much. I always have room for you. I'll always love you, especially I'll love you. Because Jesus loves you and Jesus told you that. Always especially room for you. But this is the prayer that Judy, what's Judy's last name from the UU church? Judy Allen. Judy Allen gave me that I have now has I am not good at meditating. I've never had a practice. This is now my practice. For three years during the pandemic, because I have to wear a mask to heat up my eyes so I, I don't feel so dry. So I eventually memorized this. So I want you don't have to close your eyes. You can just sit here and listen. You know, it's, it's a Buddhist prayer. It's a Buddhist meta meditation, the loving kindness prayer. But I want to read it to you the way I, the way I now say it every single day. Sometimes at night, if I wake up and can't go back to sleep and don't choose to read a book and stay up all night, I will say parts of this. I say it's for special people when they're going through hard times. I say it for several young male adults that are having problems with addiction. I think of them especially and say their names. So just listen. And if you want to copy me, you can do it. Yeah, this is But I'll say it. Um, I'll tell you how I'll say it. I'll just read it to you. The same sentences are said over and over, one, two, three, four different times. The very same five or six statements. The statements. But the first time you say it, you say it for yourself. And I realized one day after about two and a half years of saying this, it really wasn't being a, or, or this is my thing, I have no idea, but this is the way I have chosen to read it. It's really not about the John Dorsey McPherson that's standing in front of you. I'm an adult. Yeah, I've been through lots of stuff. But the part that I keep working on is that little girl. And I'm going to call her Journey because I do call her Journey every single morning. And this is how I start. My precious little Journey, because I'm saying this part to myself, to myself about me, but not the adult that I am, not this person standing in front of you. It was that little girl that was his, still has his fear that if somebody knew me, they wouldn't like me. And so I'm not going to have a place at the table. So I'm speaking to that little girl. So I call her Joni. My precious little Joni, may you be free of suffering. All, this are my words, all suffering is fear. Think about it. Work on it. Ponder it. I pondered it now since I was in my 40s. And I've concluded that all suffering is fear. May you be at peace. May you know the joy of your own true nature. My children all knew the joy of our true nature, which is the person that God created us to be, which is love, which is love. May you be healed. You know, little journey. You don't have to be afraid anymore that you're not going to have a seat at the table, that if you people know you, they won't like you. May you be healed. May you be a source of healing for others. Because if we're healing ourselves, we can be that for other people. And until we are, we can to some degree, but not fully. I don't, I don't think. These are things I ponder. I don't know. May you know love. And that is... In my way of thinking, that is who we are. And then we say it again. And I say, I say that first for myself. And then I say it for those for whom I care. And I'm telling you, I name every name. My precious little Barbara Dorsey. Mary Barbara Dorsey. Every day. For her children, for my children, for my nieces and nephews. People in my family that I love. May you be free of suffering. Like Matt, but he was called Jimmy when he was a little boy. 
So in my heart, when I say this every single morning to you, man, I say, my precious Lord Jimmy, may you be free of suffering. May you be at peace. And free of suffering is free of fear. May you know the joy of your own true nature. May you be healed. May you be a source of healing for others. May you know your own, your true nature, which is love. Now, the next one is a challenge because this is the one you say it for the people that you find very difficult in small ways or big ways. Oh, gosh. I have a lot to include in there. <laughs> and, you know, some of us might include the same people. Sometimes Trump makes the list. <laughs> we really don't have to end. Well, I always thank you, good questions for me. Anyway. So, for people that I find very difficult, and I mean this, I truly mean it. May you be free of suffering. It's the fear that causes you to feel like you don't have enough guns. It's the fear that causes you to spew hatred. It's the fear that keeps you thinking there's never enough. If I don't have all of this money, if I don't have this huge house and blah, 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 it's not enough. What are you afraid of? What in the world are you afraid of that is never enough? That you've got this empty hole within you that is never enough. And so this is what I'll say. May you be free of suffering. May you be at peace. May you know the joy of your own true nature. May you be healed. May you be a source of healing for others. May you know love. And I can tell you stories about that that are unbelievable. Unbelievable stories of having said this for a neighbor, having said it to someone else, in the things of a company. They're, they're amazing. And then the last time you say it, you say it for all, because we are one. That, that's from the book. That's from the book. It's all, it's all us. It is not us and them. This environment is up to all of us, not just this country, not just our state, not just the groups that protest and march. It is up to every single one of us. May we all be free of suffering. May we all, all be at peace. May we all know the joy of our untrue nature. If we knew we were loved, we wouldn't have to be afraid because we're already in the improved. That is the improved. That's the faith community that expresses itself in love. We are part of that group. And the truth is, no. Whether we know it or not, we are. That is our group. We're the groupies for this faith community because God said so. Jesus told us. Jesus put down his sleeping bag and said, You know, if you can't get up with me and go inside, I'm going to lay down right here with you and put my arms around you. You don't have to do anything. And that includes everybody, all of us, no matter what we've done, what thoughts we've had. May we all know the joy of our own true nature. May we all be healed. May we be a source of healing for others. May we all know well. That's, that's the grace that comes when we can even just put a toe on it any given day into this stage of harmony. And it's not a place we stay. We're not meant to stay there. But this faith community says everybody's welcome. You can be Buddhist, you can be atheist, you can be Baptist, Catholic, <laughs> Jewish, or not. Or any of that. But you're all welcome. This is a faith community that, that expresses itself in love. Thank you, John.